Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is very important as far as the dermatology and aesthetic practice is concerned. Most of us are doing laser therapy without knowing much about the laser dynamics and physics. So this lecture will not be a very exhaustive one, but I will try to highlight the important aspects of laser therapy. Introduction. Einstein's study of photoelectric effects formed the basis of modern theory of light as wave particle duality. So light is just not a wave, but it is a composition of wave and particles. Light is a form of energy that falls within the electromagnetic spectrum that extends from X-rays to radio waves. The optical radiations refers to a specific range of energies. These are ultraviolet lights that is from 100 to 400 nanometer. Then the visible light that is 400 to 7, 750 nanometers and infrared light, which is from 750 nanometer to one millimeter. So these are the radiations that are optically visible. The X-rays and radio waves are not visible. So they do not fall in the optical radiations. So remember these three wavelengths, the ultraviolet from 100 to 400. Among this, it is ultraviolet UV, U, ultraviolet C, then ultraviolet B and then ultraviolet A. Then visible spectrum and then the infrared spectrum. That is 750 to 1 millimeter. History. The acronym laser was first used by Gold in a lecture that entitled the laser light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation in 1959. So the laser is an acronym on abbreviation of the words light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So it is not just the light, but an amplified light. And why this amplified light? By the stimulated emission of radiation. So we will explain these terms as we proceed in the lecture. The first functional laser was a ruby laser that is 694 nanometer wavelength was developed by uh, Maimon in 1960. The theory of selective photothermolysis was postulated by Anderson and Parrish in 18, 1983. So even when the first laser was developed, the exact mechanism of action of the laser and range of its application was not clear. And the photothermolysis theory came in 1983, 23 years after the development of the first laser. Since then, there has been an explosive development of new lasers and application for skin disorders and cosmetic surgery. Light and laser light characteristics. By absorbing energy in the form of a photon, that photon is a quantum of electromagnetic radiation or light, quantum or portion of electromagnetic radiation or light. And the energy is delivered or absorbed in a form of photons. And by absorbing a photon or a quantum of electromagnetic radiation, electrons in an atom move to higher energy orbit. So if you remember your um, FSC um, knowledge of physics, that uh, the atoms have electrons revolving in different circuits or orbits. So the orbit that is close to the nucleus is of low energy. And as we proceed further far, the orbits are of high energy. 
in its excited and unstable state, the electrons, those electrons which have absorbed the photons, they have moved to higher energy orbits and there these electrons are in their excited or unstable state. And in this state, the electron tend to drop back to the ground state that is its original orbit. And as a result, photon of energy is released. So the energy which is taken up by the electron to move to the higher orbit, the electron tend to go back to the original orbit. And then once it go back, then this energy which it has absorbed is released. And this release is called as the spontaneous emission of radiation. So here, the amount of energy that is absorbed by the electron and the amount of energy that is released by the electron on going back to the original or ground state is the same. So it is the spontaneous emission of radiation. But in laser, we need a stimulated emission. We need more energy to be delivered to the tissue. So how this stimulated emission is generated it occurs after an already excited atom is further excited by more photons with a wavelength that corresponds to the energy gap between the excited and ground state. So by stimulated emission, these electrons, they are given more and more photons so that they become more and more excited. So once now these um, external source of energy is uh, given to the electrons and once these electrons then jump back to the original state then they would release more photons and now these photons are released um, and since these photons are created by the stimulated um, uh, generation of light of energy so these photons are called as the stimulated emission. These are not the spontaneous emission. These are the stimulated emission because now this already excited atoms are more excited by a wavelength that is delivered by an operating system. So this is a normal atom and an electron that is revolving around a nucleus. Now with an external power, uh, with, an, uh, with a certain amount of energy, certain amount of photon is emitted and this energy is then withdrawn. Then no other energy source is given. So as the source is withdrawn, the electron move back to the original orbit and release the photon of energy. This is the spontaneous emission. Now the stimulated emission. In stimulated emission, the power source continue to pump in the energy and more and more electrons become excited. And these uh, excited electrons, then when they release their energy, they will be released in more number of photons. And this emission is uh, of a photon is much more than the spontaneous emission and more intense light is generated. Importantly, each of these, the power source and the stimulated emission will have the same wavelength and the phase. That is, this energy must be uh, coherent. And in this property, which allows the light amplification. And if this, this uh, uh, power source and emission does not have the same energy and phase, light amplification would not occur. During the operation of a laser, all three of these light matter interactions, namely energizing the atoms, spontaneous and simulated emission of photons take place simultaneously. So all the processes are occurring simultaneously. The energy that is required to excite the atoms in a laser is provided by an external power source in a process that is called as pumping. So pumping in of the energy by an external power source, which is actually the laser machine, and the resultant energy or light which is released is, the, is an amplified light or light amplification. And the, uh, the energy uh, uh, of this light amplification is created by this stimulated emission of photons.
Laser light differs from light emitted by a conventional light source by its following characteristics. So the light that is delivered by the handpiece of a laser is different from the light, from a normal light, from a light source like a bulb or a tube light. How it is different? This light which is delivered by the handpiece of a laser is monochromatic. That is the identity of the excited atoms determines the wavelength. The laser, in laser, this is a narrow around a characteristic wavelength. For example, wavelength of a diode laser 8808 nanometer. So all the light that is emitted by a diode 808 nanometer will travel at with a, in this wavelength. Similarly, uh, long pulse NDAG have a 1064 nanometer meter wavelength. So all the light that is emitted from an NDAG laser will be in the range of 1064 nanometer. So this is a single wavelength that is generated from a laser and this wavelength is monochromatic for that particular laser. Coherence. The coherence means that the laser light is both temporally and septally coherent. That is, the wave is in the same phase in time and space. So that all the laser light is in the same space in time and in same phase in time and space. Collimation. Collimation means the non-divergent nature of the laser light. Um, and this would result in conserving the energy. That is the energy is delivered to a specific point and it means that the diameter of beam changes only minimally over a distance. So the laser light is monochromatic, single wavelength. It is in time and space has the same phase and it is non-scattered or non-divergent nature and it is going to, uh, the diameter of the beam is not going to change over a, uh, uh, over a particular distance. So now you, you must have heard about the different types of lasers. You have heard about a carbon dioxide laser or a diode laser or a pulse dye laser. So how these lasers are named? Lasers are usually named after the constituents of the active or gain medium, which may be the gas, liquid, solid, or semiconductor. So this is actually a... Um, internal diagram of a laser. It is, there is a gain medium. Um, this gain medium is the place where this laser uh, light interaction is going to take place. And with the gain medium, there are two mirrors. One is a fully reflective mirror and other is a partially reflective mirror. So this gain medium can be a solid state material that include crystals. And this is, uh, includes a ruby laser or alexandride laser or nd YAG laser, which is new dimium, atrium, aluminum, garnet laser or erbium YAG laser, which is erbium, yttrium, aluminum, garnet laser. So these lasers, the ruby, alexandride, nd YAG or uh, erbium YAG are uh, the lasers in which the gain medium is a solid state material. Semiconductors. If the gain medium is in a form of a semiconductor, it is a diode laser. Then if the gain medium is in a form of a liquid, like organic dyes in a solvent, then this is an example of pulse dye laser we use for vascular lesions or rhodamine dye. Then the gain medium may contain gases, like in carbon dioxide gas laser or in argon laser. This active medium is contained in an optical cavity that consists of two opposing mirrors I've shown you in the diagram, one of which is fully reflective and other is partially transparent. That is, it is reflective, but it is transparent as well. So it is also called as the output coupler. Photon moving parallel to the axis of optical cavity 
are reflected between the two mirrors and in turn eliciting an stimulated emission in the same axis. So these photons are, ex are energized by rapid reflection from the two mirrors. As a result of which a stimulated emission of light occurs. So this is a fully reflective, this is a partially reflective. And this is the place where the light is uh, moved on after multiple, um, multiple sessions of uh, reflection, reflection from the two mirrors. So the light amplification occurs. The energy required for the process of light amplification is supplied by an external source such as an electric current if the active medium is gas. So if we are dealing with a carbon dioxide laser or an, um, uh, or an argon laser, then this um, energy is provided by the electric current. Or it is provided by a light source, which we see in a flash lamp that is an IPL, if the active medium is solid. So the solid means in ND YAG laser, in erbium YAG laser, and in ruby laser, then this energy is uh, delivered by means of a light source. So it can be an electric source, it can be a light source. As the energy amplifies, the light is emitted through the output coupler into a delivery system. They transmit it to the operator handpiece. Here, the light laser pulse is generated and it is uh, transmitted to the operator's handpiece. The delivery system, now comes the delivery system, may take the form of a fiber optic cable or an articulated arm through which the light is reflected by mirrors. So fiber optic cable does not contain mirror, but the articulated arm contains further mirrors. The fiber optic cables are lighter as well as easier to operate and maintain However, they are delicate and can break when bent or twisted. So you can see these two lasers. This is a diode laser and this is a Q-switch laser. Both these two lasers are um, uh, available with this fiber optic cable. So this fiber optic cable is easy to use, can be uh, manipulated and can be moved uh, very easily. But it is delicate and can be bent and broken. And when broken, then it has to be replaced. The fiber optic cables are not sufficiently robust to transmit light emission from systems such as a carbon dioxide laser, erbium YAG laser, or the PICO laser, where articulated arms are required. So if the amount of light that is delivered or is uh, um, transmitted through the handpiece is more, then the fiber optic cable will not be sufficient. And then we have to replace this fiber optic cable with an articulated arm. And this is done in these kind of lasers. So these, this is a carbon dioxide laser, this is a pico laser, and this is a fiber optic arm. Here, there will be different mirrors within the fiber optic, within this fiber, uh, sorry, Sorry, this is an articulated arm. So there will be different mirrors in this articulated arm. And this is more robust and able to deliver more energy, but it, its range of movement is limited as compared to the fiber optic arm. But it is more, um, more stable and uh, less likely to break. Uh, so we have discussed the, um, the how the light is amplified and emitted in a laser system, what are the different types of laser systems, then how the laser light from the laser system reaches the handpiece through a fiber optic cable or an articulated arm. Now through the operator handpiece, light can be focused by a lens or transmitted as a collimated beam. Uh, I either transmitted as a beam or is more focused by a lens. 
either beam type can be scanned to limit exposure time. So the scanners are added um, at the hand at the level of handpiece so that the laser light is broken, which we call as the um, fractionation or fractional light. Laser can are also classified according to the pulse character of the beam, which may be continuous or pulsed or quality switched. So you have heard the name of a Q switch and DIAG. There is a long pulse and DIAG in which the, in which the uh, light is uh, pulsed, but uh, there is another kind of pulsing which is called a skew switch. By Q switching, the pulses are further broken into shorter pulses. The continuous wave light consists of uninterrupted beam of relative, relatively low power, uh, such as CO2 laser. So the continuous mode of CO2 laser is used as a scalpel for cutting. So this is a continuous beam of light, continuous beam, there is no interruption. Light, uh, uh, there will be, um, and no break in uh, or uh, no break in between the laser pulses. So this is a continuous beam. We see it in carbon dioxide laser. Super pulsing. Super pulsing was developed so that the laser emit a rapid train of high peak power, peak power pulses of energy. One disadvantage is that pulses are so close that there is insufficient time for cooling and causing more tissue damage. So this is good as well as bad. So the super pulsing, this is um, in the same duration in which one, you can see that in uh, this continuous wavelength, uh, although the light is uninterrupted, but the power is quite low here in this uh, continuous wavelength. But by converting this continuous wavelength to super pulsing, that is the energy is delivered in a form of uh, in form of a pulse duration of microseconds pulse duration of microseconds the amount of energy that is delivered by one pulse of light is sufficiently more as compared to the continuous light so now you can deliver by adding a super pulsing you can deliver the same amount of energy in a, with a much higher power. So by breaking the light into small wavelengths, into small pulses, by breaking the wavelength into small pulses, you can deliver more energy to the target. Now there is another kind of pulsing. That is Q switching. So what Q switching is doing? Q switching is doing the same thing as the super pulsing, but it is creating ultra short pulses in nanoseconds rather than the milliseconds. And this results in extremely high peak power that is capable of photoacoustic shattering of targets such as tattoo particles and melanosomes. So the tattoo particles or melanosomes require more power. So by, uh, for these more power to produce, we have introduced an ultra uh, short uh, pulsing and these pulses are called as the Q-switch. So in Q-switch, <clears throat> the pulse duration is in nanoseconds rather than in micro milliseconds. And, uh, but once the pulse duration uh, converts from microseconds to nanoseconds, the pulse, the power of the light increases many folds, resulting in more photoacoustic damage. The beam diameter. Now this is a separate variable as compared to the uh, pulse duration and pulse width, which we have discussed here. The beam diameter is identical to so-called spot size, which needs some degree of overlap during treatment in order to irradiate tissue more uniformly. 
So uh, once you have focused a laser on a target, usually the focusing beam is the spot size. And this spot size can be changed. And ideally, all the laser light is uh, collimated and it is delivered on the same spot size. And once you are treating a large area, these spot size should be overlapping with each other. Now we will discuss some tissue optics that are related to the laser. The effect of incident light on the tissue depends on a number of important factors. The first is reflection. This is the reflection. Four to six percent of the light is reflected at the skin surface. It is lowest when the beam is perpendicular. So if you deliver the laser light right at 90 degree to the skin surface, the amount of reflection of light will be less. But even then, there will be a little bit of reflection. If the light is delivered tangently, then the reflection will be more. And whatever light is reflected back, it's a useless light. So try not to reflect the light from the target area. Then absorption. This is the absorption. This is governed by the Beer's law, which relate to the absorption of light to the properties of substance through which the light is traveling. <clears throat> Without absorption of light, there will be no effect on the tissue. When a photon is absorbed by a target molecule or a chromophore, all of its energy is transferred to that molecule. So the absorption of light is the basis of the selective photothermolysis or chromophores, which we will explain subsequently. Then the third, uh, the basis of selective skin laser surgery. So we are now discussing the absorption. The basis of selective skin laser surgery is that light can be manipulated in terms of its wavelength. Wavelength is the distance between the successive crests of wave. This is a wavelength. Distance between a successive crest of wave. The energy content. So this is a wavelength. And this is the energy content of the laser wave. This is the energy content. And pulse duration. This is the pulse duration. Continuous pulse. Uh, this is a super pulsed. This is a Q switched nanosecond. So this is the pulse duration. So selective skin laser surgery depends upon a particular wavelength, energy content, and pulse duration so that a particular target chromophore absorb light and is select selectively damaged or destroyed. There are few endogenous chromophores and important of them are four, that is a melanin, a hemoglobin, water and collagen. While exogenous chromophore is a tattoo ink. So this graph shows three chromophores. The red is depicted uh, uh, the red is the hemoglobin and the uh, maroon is the melanin and blue is water. So this um, graph shows that the maximum absorption of light in the chromophore hemoglobin, it occurs at a wavelength somewhere between 400 to 480 or 470. But still, the absorption is there till the uh, wavelength reaches about 600. So the, usually the vascular lasers that targets the hemoglobin, they are of low wavelength. That is, the PDL is 585 to 600 nanometer, or KTP, Krypton laser, is 532 nanometer. 
then comes the melanin so the melanin is uh, usually the content of epidermis and the melanin is best targeted at again a low um, a shorter wavelength you can see the absorption of the light declines after 600 or 650 nanometer and it is minimum at 1000 nanometer that is near the infrared spectrum then comes the if we because um, there are many lasers who are working at targeting the melanin of the hairs which are the hair removal lasers you can see that these lasers they are at uh, higher wavelengths higher wavelength i will uh, tell you the benefit of higher wavelength because the more higher the wavelength the more will be its penetration since the terminal hair follicles are deep into the um, uh, epidermis uh, sorry in the dermis so they would be targeted by higher wavelength, not by shorter wavelength. Furthermore, uh, this is the melanin which is present in the hair follicle, not in the epidermis. So the most of the hair removal lasers are targeting the melanin in the hair follicle, which are located deep into the dermis. So for that, we will, we will be requiring a longer wavelength. And how to make the longer wavelength more um, uh, more energizing and uh, to target the chromophores which are present deep into the uh, um, uh, deep into the skin this is uh, done by means of super pulse by breaking the wavelength into shorter pulses then comes those lasers which are operating on the water as a chromophore and these lasers are the erbium jag laser which is operating as 15, 40 nanometer. This is round about infrared spectrum. Then the Alexandra, then there is a CO2 laser, a very common laser is operating as 10, 600 nanometer. So this is a, a mid or a, a mid infrared spectrum. So both these two lasers, which are the commonly used lasers for uh, rejuvenation, or um, uh, scarring, then these lasers are targeting water as a chromophore and they have very high wavelengths. So we discussed the two characters, the reflection and absorption. And in absorption, we discussed the different chromophores and how the chromophores and the laser light affects the absorption. Then comes the scattering. Scattering refers to the deviation of light by non-uniformities in the medium through which it passes. So the medium or the skin through which the laser passes is not a uniform type. So there will be many structures will, will, which will be scattering the laser light. And this scattering is done mainly by the collagen, the dermis. The thicker is the collagen, more will be the scatter. The scatter is mainly forward in direction. So the scattering is mainly forward and lesser in the backward direction. Scattering reduces the light energy available for absorption by the target chromophore. So if we are targeting this chromophore, this scattering of light will affect the amount of energy that is reached here. Transmission. Light that is not reflected, that is not absorbed or scattered, will pass to a deeper tissue. The shorter wavelength that is 300 to 400 nanometer scatter more and penetrate less, but a longer wavelength, 600 to 1200 nanometer, penetrates more and scatter less. Light tissue interaction. Light must have sufficient energy to alter the target structure. So this is the prime or foremost importance. If you don't deliver sufficient energy, then the target or the chromophore on which we are, we are hitting or targeting will not be affected. So energy is measured in joules, as you all know. Though it is more useful to consider it in term of fluence, fluence is also called as the energy density. 
and the fluence involves two parameters that is joules per centimeter square that is if more joule is delivered at less centimeter of a spot size it will be of higher energy or higher fluence if you increase the spot size to a bigger spot size then with the same amount of energy then the fluence will be reduced so more focused light will be of uh, higher energy the less focused light will be of lesser fluence power power is the rate at which the energy is delivered and measured in watts and watts is joules per seconds irradiance refers to the power density as we discussed here the energy density so irradiance is the power density that is energy developed delivered per unit area that is watts delivered per centimeter square we in laser surgery mainly concerned uh, are concerned with this fluence fluence and irradiance are therefore both inversely proportional to the square of the spot size so as the spot size increases the fluence or irradiance both will decrease and decrease double because it is uh, inversely proportional to square of the spot size increasing the spot size up to maximum of 12 mm mm reduces scatter and allow more photon to be transmitted to the skin so increasing the spot size reduces the scatter but will decrease the irradiance and the fluence both energy and power pulse duration is the single most sufficient variable in light tissue interaction we have discussed about the pulse duration sufficiently already how the light delivered on a tissue would affect that tissue the first is the photo stimulation this is a different phenomenon it is claimed that low energy laser light expedites wound healing with less evidence in support so if you deliver a laser light which is of low energy then it rather rather than damaging the tissue it stimulates the tissue this is also a basis of photo stimulation for hairs in we use the low energy lasers for alopecias and this is also a basis of complaint of patient who would come to you and saying that after the laser therapy the number of hairs on the face have increased so the probable reason is that you are doing uh, laser on patients with low energy so rather than damaging the hair follicles the low energy wavelength have stimulated the uh, hairs and resulted in more growth of the hairs then the second is photochemical change so here there are two things photo and chemical this forms the basis of photodynamic therapy or pdl Uh, sorry photodynamic pdt topical or systemic administration of photosensitizers and subsequent irritation ir irradiation elicits a photooxidative reaction and immediate cytotoxic effect so in a uh, for pdt lamp we first sensitize that area on which the the laser is targeted by applying Uh, some photosensitizers like immunolavulanic acid and then this light interacts with that chemical and as a result of this photochemical reaction the target area is damaged then photothermal or photomechanical reaction this is the reaction on which the most laser tissue interactions for dermatological indications fall into the heat generated by interaction of light with the chromophore results in thermal disruption of that chromophore what is a selective photothermolysis it postulates that light can be used to selectively damage or destroy a chromophore for example a light is used to destroy hemoglobin and not affect water or melanin 
Similarly, a laser is designed to target only the melanin of the skin and not the melanin of the hair follicle. Or the laser is designed to go deep into the dermis and target the water and does not, should not affect the melanin and the hemoglobin. So the first is uh, wavelength. The wavelength selected has a diff large difference in absorption coefficient of a chromophore versus the surrounding tissue. So a 10, 600 wavelength of a carbon dioxide laser would not absorb in melanin or hemoglobin during uh, its penetration into the skin. So it is, has a sufficient wavelength that is uh, targeting the particular chromophore. Then the energy. The energy is, should be high enough to damage the target and then the pulse duration, we have discussed this, should be less than or equal to the thermal relaxation time. Now we have introduced another term. That is the thermal relaxation time. So the pulse duration or pulsing is important vis-a-vis -vis the thermal relaxation time of a particular target tissue. We will be discussing that this uh, thermal relaxation time. First, the wavelength. Wavelength, we have discussed sufficiently before. It identifies a particular region of electromagnetic spectrum and color of the beam. Hemoglobin has a number of different absorption peaks, whereas absorption of melanin gradually diminishes with longer wavelengths. The longer wavelengths, although uh, they will be diminished, diminishing the absorption of melanin, but penetration will be increased. Long when wavelengths penetrate well, but is poorly absorbed by deep chromophores. So the deep melanin or melanin of the hair follicle, where the light will be absorbed less, but uh, will be delivered at the target, the longer wavelength. Then the energy fluence. The energy density is expressed as joules per centimeter square, we have discussed. For laser chromophore interaction to be successful, fluence should be high enough to cause destruction of chromophore rather than stimulating it. Then is the thermal relaxation time. So we have, uh, it is important, the thermal relaxation time is the time taken for the target to dissipate about 63% of the incidental thermal energy. So the thermal energy is delivered to a target and after the delivery, it is the time taken by that target to remove 63% of the targeted of the delivered energy from it. This time varies from a few nanoseconds in a tattoo particle to several hundred milliseconds in a leg venue. More about thermal relaxation time and its relationship with the pulse duration. Thermal damage time is another term introduced. It is the time to achieve selective damage of the target. So the thermal damage time is longer than thermal relaxation time. Practical outcome of this theory is termed as the thermokinetic selectivity. So large structures cool more slowly. Hence, with appropriate manipulation of the light source, the former can be heated to higher and thus potentially more damaging temperatures that is around 60 degrees centigrade. In light assisted hair removal, pulse duration is 5 to 50 milliseconds. It's longer than the thermal relaxation time of epidermis, but less than the melanin containing hair follicle, whose thermal relaxing time is 30 to 100 milliseconds. So usually the laser light that is used for hair removal is working on a pulse duration 
that is around 5 to 50 milliseconds. This is sufficiently or three times less than the thermal relaxation time of the target chromophore of a hair that is melanin of the hair follicle, which is around 30 to 100 milliseconds. With this pulse duration, sufficient thermal energy is accumulated in hair follicles to coagulate it. On the other side, epidermis is protected as it cools two to three times in between the pulse duration. So pulse duration is high. And since you all know that we are not targeting the epidermis in laser hair removal, we are targeting the hair follicle deep in the dermis and every energy or light has to pass through the epidermis to reach the dermis. So the thermal relaxation time of epidermis is one, um, one millisecond. But the pulse duration of our light is five to 50 milliseconds. Say it is five milliseconds and we are using contact cooling or air current or whatever is the cooling process, we are doing it continuously. So as one, um, um, one packet of energy is delivered to the target or uh, um, a particular wavelength pulse, uh, pulse of light is given to a target and it is five millisecond. During this five millisecond, we are cooling the energy to the epidermis and it is cooled three to four times while delivering one's pulse duration. So epidermis is saved because the pulse duration is more than the thermal relaxation time and the cooling is going on. But the pulse duration is less as compared to the thermal relaxation time of the target. And what, is the, what it does is that it would, in a continuous run of wavelengths, it would continuously, uh, before the target chromophore or the follicle relaxes, it would be hit by the laser light several times. Several times, hundreds of times, because the pulse duration are very short. Uh, sorry, not 100 times, uh, say about three or four times. So the target is hit three to four times during one thermal relaxation time of the target chromophore that is the hair follicle. So the target chromophore relaxation time is 30 to 100 millisecond and the pulse duration is five millisecond. So for example, if we are using a wavelength with a pulse duration of five millisecond, and let's suppose the thermal relaxation time of a hair poly follicle is 50 milliseconds. Then in one go, we are hitting the hair follicle 10 times before it gets time to relax. That is, we are in a fight. The time we are not giving up the second opponent to relax or to uh, recoup its energy and in between in the time in which it recoups the, his energy, we are hitting it many times. So this is the way the target is damaged. Before it relaxes, yeah, before it gets time to cool off and dissipates the energy from it, we have already hit the target several times to damage it sufficiently. Tissue cooling. Heat damages to the epidermis and may result in blistering, dispigmentation or scarring, and is particularly likely in pigmented skin. So be very careful while doing laser surgeries in a dark type four or five skin, because all the epidermal side effects are much more common in type four and five skin and much less common in type two and three skin. To reduce this risk, 
wavelength should be optimized with respect to absorption characteristics and depth of target chromophore so one of the protection is by increasing the uh, wavelength of the light and this time is much more than the thermal relaxation time of epidermis so in epidermis the thermal relaxation time is less than the beam of light so it has sufficient time to relax between the laser light and hence protected while in the target the thermal relaxation time is more than the laser beam and hence would be hit several time before it is able to relax use of long pulses and cooling of epidermis further reduces the risk of undesired damage to pigmented skin so it is better to perform laser surgery by a longer wavelength light as compared to shorter wavelength light that is why although the ruby laser 694 nanometer laser which was first introduced for laser hair removal co caused more damage to epidermis resulting in undesired damage like blistering scarring pigmentation now we are shifting to longer wavelength lasers like diode or alexandrite or um, uh, this uh, ndag and these wave lasers have longer wavelength and hence they damage the epidermis less one important benefit of epidermal cooling is to allow treatment at higher fluence then would otherwise be considered safe in this way reduce the number of treatment so if you deliver a high energy light Uh, through the epidermis then epidermis will be uh, will heat up and will be damaged by giving by simultaneously cooling the epidermis we can use higher fluence light or high energy light and deliver it to the target chromophore deep down furthermore cooling decreases the pain associated with treatment so the more efficient the cooling is the more uh, less is the pain because the pain endings are present only in superficial epidermis thus reducing the need of topical or local anesthesia this cooling of epidermis is achieved by three mechanisms by cold air current convection this is by using air chillers and the temperature of the air chiller is as low as minus 30 degrees centigrade and is directed onto the target area of epidermis the second is by contact cooling this is simply application of ice packs or cold water flow in hand piece so many of the hand piece have contact cooling devices so once the hand piece is applied on the face it by means of its contact cooling it will lower down the temperature of the epidermis then is the cryogen spray um anti yag lasers are uh, usually um uh, available with this um innovation that is a frozen gas or tetra fluoroethane or it can be done manually by means of ethyl chloride sprays which are available in the market and it is sprayed on the skin and then the laser light is delivered so all the three mechanisms will reduce the pain and will reduce the chances of epidermal damage while using uh, the laser with higher fluence and longer wavelengths so by this i will end my talk here in subsequent lectures i will explain the effect of um, laser interaction vis a vis particular chromophore in more details So thank you all for a very patient listening.